Hello and welcome to the Center for Spiritually Integrated Arts, a Centers for Spiritual Living teaching center. I am Reverend Dr. Raymond Anderson. I am the founder and the spiritual director. Now, as you are sitting there joining us, you may have questions, any number of questions, such as, who am I? How did I get here? Spiritually integrated arts means what exactly? What is a teaching center? Well, what about what is centers for spiritual living? What is that? What does that even mean? Or new thought or religious science or science of mind and spirit. You may have any number of questions, questions about this specific community, about the parent organization, CSL, our philosophy, our teaching, our liberation theology, any number of questions. Feel free to send an email. We look forward to connecting more and building our virtual community, our global community. And if you haven't connected yet on social media, feel free to do so. This is your invitation now. Also, did you know that all of our Sunday messages are archived on our YouTube channel? You can watch it anytime. Now, questions about anything, such as joining, becoming a member, what does that mean? What, what does membership entail? And if you live somewhere far and already belong to a spiritual community, can you be a member of more than one? The simple answer is, Yes, you can. Just like you can shop at more than one grocery store, you can attend or be a member of more than one gym. We are building beloved community. So you can do both. You can be a member of both. You can be involved with both. That's what being in spiritual community means. So we welcome you. We invite you. We are so appreciative that you have found this community and that you have joined us today. We bless you. We love you. We welcome you. Live long and prosper. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of our Sunday message. Love you. Connect with you soon. Blessings.
Namaste and greetings, and welcome to our final Sunday of the month. And today we are discussing the idea, the theme, the truth about wholeness and disability. According to the science of mind and spirit, every person is an individualization of the one spirit, regardless of physical or mental abilities. Wholeness is not determined by any physical conditions, but by recognizing the inherent spiritual essence within each individual. Disabilities and differences are understood as unique expressions of the one spirit, and physical or mental conditions do not limit a person's worth or spiritual potential. Embracing this perspective fosters true inclusivity and belonging, values the contributions of every individual, and challenges societal norms and the status quo. We are called to dismantle barriers, liberation theology, dismantle barriers and create spaces of love acceptance, genuine inclusivity, belonging in all of our spiritual centers and beyond. Breathe. Your body is entitled to your respect. Period. Your body is entitled to your respect. Do you respect your body? Because if, if you tend to not even respect your body, chances are you are going to disrespect or not respect another's body. And this goes directly into the idea of what we're talking about today, disabilities, etc. See, one of the reasons why people disregard various people, whether it's a visible disability or an invisible disability, is because we have lost the ability to respect our own bodies. But why? Why have we lost this ability? Because there are the stories that we tell about ourselves, right? Like there's the story that I tell me about me. There's the story that I tell me about you. And there are the stories that I have been told by someone about myself and about you. And based upon these stories, we create barriers and blockages. We deny diversity, equity, and inclusion because of these stories that we have become so dependent upon. Now, some disabilities are visible. You can recognize them, right? There's something that we can say, oh, there's a wheelchair. Oh, there's a walker. Oh, like there are certain, we, we are more readily able to identify. But then there are many disabilities that are invisible disabilities that you can't see. You can't readily see deafness. Even if a person has a hearing aid, it's not a guarantee that they're deaf. Now you may say, well, they're hard of hearing. Yes, and yet, not all deaf people wear or have hearing aids. And just because you see someone signing doesn't mean they're deaf. Autism, you don't see it, right? So keep that in mind, but also keep in mind this term disabilities depends on where you are. Some do not like the term disabled and they say, refer to me as differently able. And there are others who say, do not call me challenged or handicapped or handy capable or blah, blah, blah. I am disabled. For me, it's a matter of 
what do you want to be called? Now we could say the same thing about the LGBTQ community. Do you prefer to be called gay or queer? Do you prefer non-binary, gender fluid? Gen the terms and words matter. So rather than just assume, when you meet people, listen. How do they refer to themselves? And even there, like there's this fine line between, oh, they're referring to themselves as disabled or even differently abled, but they're doing so from a non-life affirming way. It's not my job or your job to force them to change. Meet them where they are. Respect them where they are. Build relationship. And then we evolve together. Kang Kijaro Gwen says, abled does not mean enabled. Disabled does not mean less abled. Breathe that in. Because oftentimes we assume that, oh, well, they are an able-bodied person. They can do X, Y, and Z. They're disabled, so they can't do X, Y, and Z. I was recently watching something that's escaping me right now where one of the people who spoke, they testified at something referencing this idea of disabilities. And the person was, they used to be a mountain climber and something happened and they lost their legs. And they, oh, I know what I was watching a special about Oscar, Oscar Pistorius in South Africa. It was a documentary and someone was testifying about how prosthetics don't give the person an added extra skill boost. And like I said, there was this mountain climber who had prosthetics and was climbing mountains. And there were those able-bodied people who were accusing him. Well, of course, you're going to climb better now. You have prosthetics. So you think the prosthetics make me the bionic man or something like that? It's easy for us to feel like it's the same thing that happens within uh, trans, specifically transgender women in sports. And people will say, well, of course, the transgender woman is going to be better at swimming or track or whatever because they're a man. Well, if that's the case, then your same argument when it's a transgender man in sports shouldn't they be losing them since by your logic but there's transgender mma fighters and boxers and track stars who are beating the cisgender men so your own logic is flawed once again we get caught up in these stories and with these stories about able-bodied ableism disabled we get lost in the story but our invitation, especially we in New Thought, CSL, our vision being a world that works for all, how do we make sure that our teaching, our centers, our communities are accessible, that we are focused on what it means to have accessibility? You know, if we were to go from center to center, from place to place, church to church, how accessible is the building? The location, handicap parking, ramps, elevators. What about is the Science of Mind textbook in Braille for those who are blind? How many of our centers, communities have interpreters for those who are deaf? Right, like in there, in the vast, then there's more, and there's more, and there's more. Are we ensuring? 
or what is our invitation to ensure that we are being more accessible? Because you can't be inclusive without having accessibility. People cannot feel like they truly belong if there's no language access. If there's no mobility access, cognitive access. Lack of accessibility, other people's assumptions, body ideals, and lack of self-confidence among people with disabilities are often the biggest barriers for diversity. And I would add diversity and inclusion because the diversity is there, but it's the inclusion. The lack of accessibility not having ramp, not having interpreters. Other people's assumptions, those stories that I mentioned. Body ideals, this is the perfect body and blah, 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 and this is what it means to be abled. And a lack of self-confidence among people with disabilities based upon stories and based upon how we deny and how we project the story on them. Oh, you poor disabled person. It must suck to be deaf and not hear music. It must suck to be blind and not see art. And depending on that individual, they embody the same way racism can be embodied. White supremacy can be embodied. Homomysia can be embodied. Ableism can be embodied. And then this person sees their self-confidence, self-esteem, self-worth start to deteriorate. And all of these things become barriers to true inclusion and belonging. Let's pause for a moment. This is one reason why this community, SIA, is committed to being deaf-friendly and accessible to the deaf community. And whether you know it or not, I just want to share a little bit about what it means for there to be inclusion within the deaf community. Because it's a little bit more than just language, right? It's understanding that there is a medical view of deafness as a pathology. Deaf people are broken and they are flawed because they cannot hear. But within the culture and within the community, the cultural view of deafness is a sense of belonging and being perfect just as is. And if we're truly going to be inclusive and foster a world that works for all, then it's important to understand these two viewpoints, stories, and understand what it means to have a cultural perspective because then I understand the person in their culture and I do not see them as being broken or flawed. It's also an understanding that there is lowercase d deaf and capital D deaf. We, they both spell the same word though, right? Yes, they do, but they mean different things within the culture. Lowercase d, they may not have attended a school for the deaf, whereas capital D, they have a very strong deaf identity. Lowercase, described based upon that pathology, the medical viewpoint. The other, culturally deaf. Lower, identifies more with hearing people. The other, tends to attend schools for the deaf, is deeply involved in the deaf culture, the deaf community, etc. The other generally doesn't or necessarily eh, maybe will associate within the deaf community, but not really be mm, involved, whereas the others are members of the deaf community. They are deeply involved in the community and the culture. They are deeply involved in the promoting of and nurturing of the language and the people, etc. Now, this community is deeply, now we work with both of these, wherever the per meet people where they are. But it's important to know that we, in order to include and belong, we respect and value deaf people from the cultural viewpoint. It's important for us in general to understand what the cultural aspect includes. 
And how do we include this stuff as part of our accessibility? Back to our regularly scheduled program. You are a perfect idea in infinite mind. You are whole right now. And this wholeness is the only way the universe knows itself as you. Because it's not an anthropomorphic universe. You are already whole, perfect, and complete because of what you are, not what you can do or can't do. That person is already whole, perfect, and complete. It's not dependent upon what they can or can't do. Wholeness or oneness. Humanity is a singular entity made up of many individuals. All the people in the world, humanity, made up of individual beings. Humanity, one's kindness and compassion as displayed towards others. In order to create a world that works for all, we must deeply express from our humanity oneness, wholeness, made up of a great many individuals. Humanity, the condition of being human. Humanity, the condition of being human. Wholeness and oneness as expressed in the whole oneness of the individual. This is the exact same thing as when we talk about God, oneness, etc. Humanity, wholeness made up of a plethora of individual humans, but it's still one humanity. There's only one power and one presence. We call it God. We can call it whatever we want to call it, but there's only one, and what it is is everything, which means it must include you. So you can't exist outside of it. You are the exact same thing it is. As absolute wholeness, you being what it is, you, too, must be an expression of absolute wholeness, no matter what you can or cannot do. Where is God? It's a blank screen. Right? Now, Voltaire said God is a circle whose circumference is nowhere and whose center is everywhere. Well, if the center, Jimmy, just looking at this, the center of the circle is that single dot. But if the circle circumference is nowhere and the center is everywhere, then that everywhere means everywhere. Right? Like, take, take this in. Like, let's go back for a second. Take it in. Circumference nowhere, center everywhere. So where is God? Where is the center? There's not a spot where God is not. So if it is everywhere, the center is everywhere, then the center must be right where you are, right where that person in a wheelchair is, right where that person who is neurodivergent is right where it has to be where everyone is. The infinite wholeness and oneness everywhere. So if I ask you, just for the sake of an experiment, or as we talked about last week, a sex experiment, what do you see? What is this? If you said apple pie, how do you know? Because you have a concept of what an apple is. Apple is a concept that says, I understand apple. This ties into wholeness. I understand apple, which means no matter what shape, no matter what form, I see apple. I understand 
what an apple looks like. I understand what an apple is, no matter how it shows up. Apple as pie, I know that. Apple as logo, I know that. Apple as drawing, I know that. I see it. I don't have to look at one and say, huh, what? I mean, um, is it, um, maybe it's, um, it's red. Well, that one's not, I don't know. We understand the concept of apple. We understand the concept of human, which is how we, excuse me, which is how we can differentiate between owner, quote unquote, doggy daddy, and furry child. I can tell the difference between you're the human, you're the quote unquote pet, you're the cat. I know the difference because I know the concept of humanity. I understand the concept of apple. Do we understand the concept of wholeness that no matter where we look, no matter who we meet, we still see wholeness? We still see oneness? Because no matter if the apple shows up as applesauce, apple cider, doesn't matter. We still understand that it goes back to the concept, the wholeness of what apple means the source of each of these expressions of apple trace right back to the source there can be no apple pie if there is no apple because if you remove the term and the fruit completely from the consciousness of all humanity you can't pop up and say look what i made i made apple fritters what the hell is an apple? Oh, it's a good question. I don't know. I just, you have to have the source from which it came. Apple pie comes from the source apple. You don't dice up apples, put them into this dish, and somehow come up with lemon meringue. Apple begets apple. Lemon begets lemon. Wholeness begets wholeness. God begets God. The math, maths, perfectly and precisely. Our invitation is to embody it. Positive thinking, the term you know that I do not use, but we'll go ahead with Dr. Holmes for the moment. Positive thinking does not mean aggressiveness or the use of will Ray what are you doing I'm I'm thinking positively I'm forcing my what do breathe 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 eat some apple pie calm down does not mean aggressiveness or the use of willpower but rather positive thinking is a dynamic and affirmative attitude toward life Life affirming thinking is, that's my term. Life affirming thinking is this the power and create, creativity that reside by nature, by nature in our thought, in our whole mental equivalent. This is directed through the process of prayer and more stuff, but once again, sticking with him. Through the process of prayer of faith, which is based in the conviction that there must be a wholeness that is back of everything. Constructive affirmative thinking leads us to that wholeness, reminds us of that wholeness, and faith in that wholeness is our key to the fruits of its action. When we are aligned with a life-affirming mental equivalent, and that engages in not just prayer, because for me, prayer isn't simply some activity we engage in. Prayer is how we live our lives daily. And we embody this life-affirming mental equivalent, thoughts, words, emotions, and feelings, and actions. Then that 
connects us to our wholeness. And when we understand and we embody our wholeness, then we see things in our lives change. Now, since I've already told you I don't necessarily like the way he's phrasing this, let's remix it. Life-affirming thinking is a, is a dynamic, powerful declaration of that which affirms life. And you see, you know, you know, so when I say affirms life, what am I talking about? It affirms God, source, spirit. It affirms the highest expressions of love, joy, wonder, peace, and power. There is only one life, and that life is all of that. And that life is your life now. So life affirming thinking affirms life, including your life now. The power and creativity that reside by nature in our thoughts are directed through the process of our way of life, which is based on our current mental equivalence. The invitation is to be aligned in life affirming ways and to embody the conviction that there must be wholeness back of everything. Constructive life-affirming mental equivalence leads us to recognizing that wholeness and anchors us in life-affirming faith in that wholeness. And when we do it for ourselves, it is far easier to do it and see it and recognize it in others, no matter, no matter what is going on in their lives. Once again, let us pause for a personal story of what it meant for me to grow up as a caregiver. My father was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, a myothropic lateral sclerosis, when I was in elementary school. I think I was eight. For a couple of years, there were no signs or symptoms. He was able to get around, still had great mobility. And then he started have, having difficulties walking. It didn't affect any other mobility issues, like his dexterity was fine. It was just walking. So he started walking with, started walking slower, started walking with a cane. Cane became a walker. And then Walker became a wheelchair. As an eight-year-old, I was conditioned and trained into being, in essence, my father's primary caregiver up to a certain point. Because eventually I moved, and then a couple of years later is when he died. And I blamed myself. Oh, the guilt. But I digress. So this idea of being a caregiver. It can be challenging to, one, still be able to acknowledge, honor, respect, love, etc. Someone through each phase of what you acknowledge and recognize as a quote unquote deteriorating body, deteriorating mind, etc. Because even when my, my maternal grandmother had to live with us because she ended up with dementia and Alzheimer's. So witnessing the deterioration of her mind, already being a caregiver, which at that time my father and I were helping to caregive for her, making her lunch and breakfast and dinner and making sure she was eating and stuff. Now I mention this because it is easy for the caregiver to lose sight of not just the wholeness of the other person, but our own wholeness. Because then we start to identify the service with who and what we are to such a degree that when the person dies or whatever happens, we are now riddled with a form of guilt or depression or a sense of failure. How did, had I been able to do better, be better, they would have still lived or whatever story we tell. This idea of our intrinsic wholeness exists. My father was whole, perfect, and complete before Lou Gehrig, during, 
and after. We all are whole, perfect, and complete before my surgery, during the surgery, immediately after in the healing and the almost dying last June, and even now, whole, perfect, and complete. How do you or how are you invited to see and acknowledge yourself as still being whole, perfect, and complete, no matter what, to see another person as whole, perfect, and complete, no matter what. In a society that functions optimally, in the most life-affirming way, those who can should naturally want to provide for those who can't. That's how it's designed to work. I truly believe we are here to take care of one another. In summary, what he's saying is we are here to be 21st century Good Samaritans. We are here to help others attain liberation. In order for that person who is in that wheelchair to be able to get into the courtroom or to be able to get into the hospital or school, they need to have access. I, who already have access, I can take the stairs. What am I invited to do to ensure that they too have access? Do I need to write a petition? Do I need to speak before Congress? What do I need to do to ensure that they have what they need as well? How am I the 21st century New Thought Good Samaritan? See, it's easy for us to become enslaved to the stories we tell, to be bound by whatever these stories are. It's easy. No matter what the volumes of stories are, we tell, our, tell stories about what it means to be blind, what it means to be neurodivergent. We used to tell stories about what it meant to be Depending on who you're talking to, there was that M word that used to be used for a person of a certain height. Those who have or experience dwarfism. We, we've had stories through a variety of. Question is, are we still bound by those stories? Any mental equivalent that will not facilitate the highest and best and most effective affirming life, most affirming quality of life must be examined and shifted if liberation is what we desire. If we want a world that works for all, then we need to make sure that all means all. Otherwise, we are simply practicing another form of segregation. It's no longer about being black or white. It's about being able-bodied and disabled. It's about being hearing and deaf, and we segregate. That's not a world that works for all. Everyone is welcome to our community and our center, as long as you don't need a wheelchair, or as long as you don't have a wheelchair because we don't have ramps, as long as you're not deaf because we don't have interpreters, as long as you're not blind because we have nothing in Braille, breathe. When we know what science of mind and spirit is, when we practice it, and when we live it as a way of life, we not only understand our wholeness, perfection, and completeness, but we include everyone at the table of equity and equality. No matter the person's needs or abilities, we use the creative principle to make adjustments. So physical spaces, books, curriculum, classes, conversations, boardrooms and bedrooms and beyond are accessible in all ways needed. When we say oneness and wholeness, this includes everyone. Every one of our disabled family members, friends, 
lovers, partners, neighbors, and even strangers that we have never met. A world that works for all means all. And before I go to the affirmation, I want to remind us, last week we talked about sex. Do we have a certain story in our mind about disabled people not being sexual beings? Because I can remember growing up and there being several stories in the news about how certain individuals with Down syndrome wanted to marry and blah, blah, blah. People were like, oh, the lies you tell. I don't even want to envision the fact that y'all going to get married and have sex. And No, the people, family members, the court system fought to say no. That's not inclusive. It doesn't foster belonging. It's a form of emotional and psychological and physical terrorism. It is the exact opposite of liberation. And that those kinds of stories will not create a world that works for all. This week's declaration or affirmation, I'll say it first. And if this resonates with you, I invite you to say it with me the second time around. I recognize the wholeness of myself and everyone I meet together. I recognize the wholeness of myself and everyone I meet. Breathe. This week's study questions, however you choose to do them, whether alone in a small group or with our Thursday night study group. When is it hardest or most challenging for you to see your own wholeness? What about another's wholeness? What stories hold you captive? Number two, when something happens in your physical body or to your physical body that is outside of your control, how do you respond? Do you blame yourself? It must have been in my consciousness. Or do you nonetheless see your inherent wholeness in spite of. I, I remind people that this exact thing is what came up several times between the cancer diagnosis, the surgery, and the healing, because there were a variety of people who asked me, Ray, why did you create this? Why, why, why was that in your consciousness? So through all of that, my invitation was to come back and say, this diagnosis, this process, this thing that my body is doing, I can't and change it. It's beyond my control per se, but I can work in partnership with what I do have control with, my health team, et cetera, to remind myself of my wholeness, my perfection, and my completeness to move through that healing journey unto today. It's a process ongoing. Number three, how do you feel in your spiritual community when you are struggling in any way? You could be struggling emotionally, physically, cognitively, doesn't matter. How do you feel when you are struggling? What would greater support look like for you? Number four, how do wholeness and oneness relate to one another? And lastly, in a world that works for all, what might belonging and inclusion look like for a variety of disabilities? What about in our spiritual communities? What would it look like for our spiritual communities, for every CSL to be open, welcoming, belonging, et cetera, accessible to a variety of disabilities? And we breathe. As we enter into that space of infinite awareness, knowing, 
infinite embodiment, infinite expressing. Because one of the things we often say in CSL is treat and move your feet. To which I often am reminded, treat is moving your feet. And moving your feet is how you treat. Both and. Prayer isn't simply something we do as an activity. Separate from, prayer is how you make a bowl of cereal and eat it mindfully, joyfully. Tasting it and enjoying it, being in that state of pleasure. Prayer is how we listen to music or sing along as as we drive from point A to point B. Prayer is how I personally, how I harass Tracy and pick with Tracy so that I may, whether she laughs or not, it's, it's about me in this moment, how I am brought to laughter, which eventually she shakes her head and she laughs. Prayer is this and all of this and more. It's how we garden, how we bake. Prayer is all of this because that which God is, is all of this. So when I anchor in and understand my wholeness, then I understand that creating greater accessibility is prayer. Ensuring that people are included is prayer. Providing language access and cognitive access, etc., is prayer. All of this is the amen that we give in how we show up. And that which is the law says yes. Meaning the moment we have the idea to be more accessible and we are aligned with our mental equivalent to make it happen, the law is already moving and shifting and shaping so that when we act upon it, the resources are present, the people are present, the funds are present, the what is needed, the knowledge, the wisdom, the intelligence is present. It shows up some way, shape, or form when we are open to it, when we live it and breathe it as a way of life. So knowing that the law is already moving, shifting, and shaping to make this community more inclusive and accessible to more and more and more, knowing that that is already in motion, then I also know that other CSLs and unities and churches and centers and communities are also doing the same, being the same. That's what it means to be a world that works for all. That's, that's precisely what this prayer is saying is already done. If it exists in the mind that is God, fully formed and fully functioning, then that means it's already answered prayer. So knowing that it's already answered prayer, just like I know that once I place an order with the, the server in a restaurant, I go in and have my conversation with Tracy and Rainica or Robin and we chat because I know and trust that what has been spoken is being taken care of and that when it is delivered to me, answered prayer, prepared meal. I dig in and taste and enjoy and embody it. So right now, I dig into a world that works for all. I taste it, enjoy it, and embody it and live it as a way of life. And all of creation says amen, to which I say amen as well, because I know it is done. And so it is. And so it is. Namaste, blessings. Today is a day for the Zoom fellowship. So if you are available, I will see you there. And if not, I will see you somewhere during the week or right here next Sunday. Same bat channel, same bat time. <laughs> Love and appreciate you.